Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In this episode, I have the privilege of interviewing the Chief Financial Officer of Baseballism, John Loomis. Truth be told, John and I have known each other for many years, and I have had the honor of watching Baseballism's strategic growth from the sideline. Now, I say strategic growth because that's exactly how Baseballism grew. In this episode, we discuss the importance of small successes. Albert Bandura once used this process of guided mastery, a series of small successes to help people gain courage and overcome deep-seated phobias. Baseballism's approach to strategic growth is very similar. Why? They started with the low-hanging fruit first. Rome wasn't built in the day and neither was baseballism. As entrepreneurs, the truth is this. Success doesn't happen overnight. Start small and grow. Failures suck but instruct. Talk to seasoned innovators in your field. They will likely have an impressive collection of war stories to learn from. I encourage you, the listener, to seek out the consumer and find their need. The most successful companies are the ones that figure out how to address a consumer need. Sometimes, even when the consumer doesn't even know that there is a need for it. So, get out there, talk to your consumers, and start innovating. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. graduated from the University of Oregon where him and his club baseball teammates took a summer camp and turned it into a $20 million company. Please welcome the Chief Financial Officer of Baseballism, John Loomis. All right. Thank you, John Loomis from Baseballism, the Chief Financial Officer. Thank you so much for joining me on the Shades of Entrepreneurship. Let's get into this. I want to uh, hear who is... Jonathan Lomas. Well, Gabe, thanks for having me. No, thank you. First and foremost. Yes. Uh, So we actually go way back. We do. Yes. It's good to see you again. Um, Okay. So who am I? I I guess I'll start at the beginning because that's where we usually start. I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I was born in Monterey, California uh, on a military base. I'm from a military family. I spent the first seven years of my life overseas. Uh, grew up in Naples, Italy, and then moved to Oregon in about 1989 and have been here ever since. So I've went to the university of Oregon, got a degree in economics, stayed in the state of Oregon and haven't really ventured outside of the state of Oregon in terms of like places I've lived, um, married my high school sweetheart. Uh, and then I started my career in, in Portland. I, it, and I, I remember this, like it was yesterday, but I was graduating. It was spring break. It was the spring break before I graduated and it was my undergrad year. Or I'm, uh, I'm sorry. It was my, it was my, uh, I was my four year degree. And I remember applying for jobs in spring break. I was in my parents' house. And I found a play, I found a, a listing at Oregon Health Science University, mm-hmm. which is, you know, the only academic medical center in the state of Oregon. It's one of the largest employers. And I applied for this job. I got a call like within 24 hours, I got a call. <laughs> and so I took the call and I'm still in college. Right. And so, uh, I took this call. I interviewed while I was still trying to get over the finish line in, oh, wow. uh, of school. And I got the job. And my boss, you know, who was hiring me was willing to wait nice uh, the 30 days until I graduated and moved back to Portland. So it was like, I didn't, you know, a lot of, a lot of my friends, they graduate and they're like, I'm going to go, go to Europe. I'm going to go to Australia. I'm going to go to you know, travel the world. <laughs> yeah. uh, I didn't do any of that. I, I literally started working the, the, the day after I graduated and I drove up to Portland and then 
got married, you know, a couple months later and, uh, uh, just kind of started my career that way. So that's, that's kind of like my background. Yeah, education. no, that's great. That's <laughs> so, so healthcare, mm-hmm. you, 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 you were in healthcare. What did you do in healthcare? Yeah. So that, so that job I applied for mm-hmm. was in a finance and accounting Okay, and I got a degree in economics. And so I kind of was like, I enjoyed numbers. I kind of enjoyed the the nuts and the bolts of the business. And, and I jumped into, um, a very low level kind of analytic position uh, in in the information technology group uh, sector of OHSU, and so anyway, and so I wasn't in you know I wasn't in delivering healthcare. I'm not a doctor. I'm not like I'm not a hands on guy with patients. I was really on the backside, looking at reports and looking at profitability and projects. And a lot of what I was doing was forecasting costs on and software projects, mm-hmm. and that was kind of my window into into healthcare. And I stayed in that field. I have never left it. I've to this day. I really enjoy accounting, budgeting, financing, um, uh, forecasting, the analytics, the profitability stuff. Like I've kind of always stuck with that. Yeah. So so did financing now baseballism? How did how did that kind of begin? And where, where's the uh, where's the beginning story for that? So baseballism it actually pre- predates uh, OHSU. I when I was at the University of Oregon. One of my call, I, I played club baseball there. Okay. So, it, you know, this is not a, or University of Oregon didn't have a D, D1 baseball team at the time, but it had a club team and club sports is, is a big across the country, right? So I joined the team my sophomore year. Uh, I got to know a, a ton of guys at the time. One guy in particular, Travis, he became my roommate later on at, at college. Um, and our our baseball experience at, at Oregon was was unique because although we were a club team, we were we were actually pretty good, and we joined this this uh, this uh, national league called Club. Uh, it was National Club Baseball Association, and we joined. It was early in the in that league's history, but we joined in, and we started winning, and we went to the World Series like like ended up being like seven years in a row or something crazy. Oh, wow. We started this great history, but the first year we joined, we we made it to the World Series. And I met and became friends with a lot of guys through that process. So baseballism uh, initially started as a youth baseball camp. Mm. And so Travis, my roommate and my, my, uh, uh, my teammate, he had the idea of starting up a youth camp. Right. And cause he looked around and he was like, look, we're in Eugene, Oregon. Baseball is not like, this is not an epicenter for baseball. Pacific with Northwest typically isn't the Beavers are a bit of a, a yep. uh, an exception to that. You know, they've, they're very successful, but uh, from the, from a youth sports perspective, Oregon is not really considered a baseball state, but so Travis saw this like need. And so he's like, let's start a baseball camp. This was our senior year. Um, he, we actually bought, we purchased an existing youth camp from somebody. Interesting. And it was called uh, safe at home. Okay. And he had this like, you know, roster of players. And so I think we paid like $2,000 for this mm-hmm. camp. And we immediately re and like looking back, it was ridiculous. We could have just started <laughs> our own, uh, but we paid $2,000 for this camp immediately changed the name. And then, but we, we inherited, you know, a, a group of kids and, just started up a camp and it was just a bunch of, it was a bunch of college guys wanting to, we weren't even trying to make a ton of money. It was just like, we wanted to do something good. Mm. Um, we named branded the camp baseballs and we created camp t-shirts like every, like, mm. like most people do. Right. And yep. it just said baseballs them across the, the front. And the reason we named it baseballs them is because we're lit, like, you know, put yourself back in 2005. Right. And we're looking on, we're just trying to buy a domain name. Oh yeah. The word baseball. <laughs> yeah. Like no jokes. Like, uh, we want a domain name that had the word baseball, it mm, baseball gotcha. in it. And we landed on baseballism and purchased the domain name and, uh, held on to it and said, okay, that's what we're going to call the camp. And, uh, and, and that was, but that, that name is kind of powerful for a lot of reasons and I'll, and I could touch on that, but, but basically that's the, that's the beginning of, of the name baseballism. And there's this camp teacher t-shirt that says baseballs on the cross at the front. And I, there's this iconic like drop instead of an eye. It's a, it's a drop bat. It's like a, basically yep. a baseball bat. Yeah. An eye, right. And we've, we've held on to that kind of that imagery for a while, but 
that was the beginning of this whole thing. And, um, fast forward, right? So we start this camp, it goes on for about two years. And then you can imagine like everyone gets, everyone graduates and, and gets married. I went back to Portland. I got a job, mm-hmm. you know, like quote unquote real job, <laughs> uh, working at the, the, the hospital and, um, the camp, you know, we dissolved the camp. Right. And, and I didn't, I probably didn't talk to Travis for a couple of years. Not cause like we had a falling out, but just cause right. everyone kind of goes their own separate ways. Right. And I'm right. like, you know, I'm off doing my thing and he goes and does his thing. Um, okay. So then 2012 comes around. I get an email from Travis and I had seen him off and on, like we we're still friends and stuff. And he's living in Beaverton. Um, I think he's teaching at the time. And he, he emails me and he, and along, uh, the, the funny thing, so I still held, I kept on this email because I thought it was kind of a good piece of history for the business. But he emailed not just me, but a bunch of people. Okay. Like you get an email blast and there's yeah. 20 people in this email. And a lot of people I don't even know. Um, and the, he opens up this email and it was saying, hey guys, I got this idea. Um, I want to reimagine baseballism, the camp that I started, that we started 2005, um, into a clothing brand. And he said, and he even, he had tested it out. He had made a run of the camp t-shirt and he had put it into a batting cage facility in Beaverton and it like, you know, it sold out. Oh, right? interesting. So nice. he kind of like, it was a, his little proof of concept, right? Yeah. Um, and he said, hey, anyone who's interested in being part of this show up at my house next week. Wow. Wednesday. And the only people that showed up were the people who started the camp. Wow. You know, seven years prior and anybody could have, I mean, anyone who was interested could have shown up, but no one, no one did. And so that it, the same people who started the camp responded to that email. We all got together and said, okay, let's launch this thing. And it's, yeah. And, and that's how it started. That that's incredible. That and I think beginning. that's an important story for entrepreneurs to hear is, is essentially first, the first thing that was done is Travis identified a need, right? That the youth baseball in Oregon, there was a lack of that um, kind of influence or, or, you know, programs. And it sounds like that was that first step. Right. And then, and then kind of progressing organically, right. Into building it that, that now that tested concept piece is that kind of how, you know, you guys built baseballism to what it is today? Yeah, there, I think you touched on it and how I, I definitely, you know, so here's the, here's the nuts and bolts of like, I think why baseballism was, has been successful. Um, and for those who don't know, maybe I could, I, I, I would take a step back and describe what baseballism t- is today. Yeah. So, right. So um, baseballism, it's a lifestyle apparel brand. You know, we do graphic t-shirts, hats, hoodies, outerwear, um, uh, accessories, leather, a lot of leather products, women's purses. Yep. A lot of, you know, we tell a glove leather story and a lot of our products. So, you know, we basically took an off the field approach. We have 11 retail stores across uh, the country. Um, we have an online platform. We don't do a lot of wholesale, but we're starting to do more and more. And, you know, we're like $20 million brand. So, you know, it just, it was born out of a baseball camp. And so it's, it's got a lot of legs. It's got a lot of followers. We have about 1.5, 1.6 million followers on social media plat all against with all of our social media platforms. Um, and so it's, it's become a thing, right? It's like, we actually found this niche into your, to your question, right? This little segue into the, to your ultimate question of, we identified a need and um, I, I think there's kind of two pieces to that. One is um, the, the need uh, baseball people ex- experienced prior, like uh, prior to us and other who's who people who've jumped in the space, pe- people who love baseball experienced it by buying MLB franchise. Gear. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. Right. So if, yep. and that was, you know, it was really, it was typically the team, like if you're, if you're a young player, um, you're 12, 13 years old, you would have your own team gear, which is very common. Like I have a like t-shirt that says, you know, the, the Raiders across the front or whatever that you're, you're Go your Raiders. Is, right. Yeah. Um, and then you might also be a fan of fill in the blank. You might also be a fan of the 
angels or mm-hmm. the Padres or the Dodgers, right? And that might be like the, the MLB franchise that you look up to and, and you watch on TV. And so your, your, you know, your love of the game was expressed by buying kind of that, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and so the need that we identified over time and, and actually right away was there's a humongous group of baseball enthusiasts yeah. who they might have their MLB franchise that they like, but they re- they, but they like or, or play the game on a level that opens them up to all other sorts of like inside information mm. about baseball that gotcha. no one was talking about. So for those who are baseball people or baseball fans, um, you'll, you'll know right away, like, there's inside things about baseball that only baseball people get. Yeah. And this is common in a lot of other sports too. This isn't just unique to baseball, but I think baseball has, because of its tradition and history, it has maybe more of this cachet than other, uh, other sports. Um, and we simply tapped into that reservoir of inside information that, that, that you really had to be a baseball person under. And we found our market and that youth player. So, and I, this resonates with me being someone who grew up in, in Oregon, that we don't have a major league baseball franchise in Oregon. Right. Yep. So I never, I kind of like kind of tacked on to whatever, uh, whatever network was playing at the time as like, gotcha. I, I used to be, I was a really big Braves fan because TBS was mm, yep. owned the Oregon yep. market. Um, and so during the nineties and I became a huge Braves fan and I also like, you know, um, the Cubs were on all the time because WGN, yep. It was just really like you were just kind of influenced by that. And so I guess what the point is, is like when you're younger and you're playing it and you're in, and it becomes a lifestyle, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the sport became a lifestyle and no one was really speaking to the lifestyle of, of the sport. And so we just filled that need and we found it right away. And it was, it, it there's two pieces again to this is one is we timed it right. And I think, I, you know, I can't under, I can't undersell how, um, important timing is, mm-hmm. um, when there's a window of opportunity, you got to take it because for us, the timing was no one was in the space yet because everyone kind of thought baseball had to be experienced through a franchise. Interesting. Um, and, and we kind of uncovered that that's not true. Uh, and then also look, social media back in 2012 yeah. was way different than it is now. Yeah. Right. So Instagram wasn't even a thing yet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And Facebook was the thing. It was the platform and it was free back then. So it, it was easy to build an audience, make organic content, have it be shared and have it spread. Twitter was the other kind of Avenue. So we time, we found this window and at the time you don't know it's a window, but, but looking back, you realize you had a very kind of unique window. We found this, missing need and we found a platform to get the message out and we just we just took advantage of that yeah you know what's it's kind of interesting about it too is i feel like there was there was a point in time around that 2001 to 2000 kind of after the steroid era right where, where you know bonds and or the alleged steroid era we don't really know right it kind of seemed like the the interest uh around america in baseball kind of declined a little bit and and i would say i'm not i'm not saying baseballism did it single-handedly, but since these kind of sayings come out, uh, has, you know, for the last couple of years or so, 10 years, I've been noticing like even major league baseball players wearing baseballism, you know, apparel and, and kind of talking about the sayings, the, cl- the cliches, right. That you mentioned, how, how has that kind of grown, um, your, your program or did, was that kind of already, did you guys already kind of had major league baseball players that are interested in your brand or was it kind of like the brand grew and then they became interested? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's that. I think, um, we, we always came from like a really authentic kind of like yeah. perspective and we always play and authenticity is a word you hear a lot, but it's like, I can't, I can't underscore that enough. Like what are, if you're building a business, yeah. right. And, and in my look, I'm not going to tell everyone what to do. Cause it's like, I really only have my own experience here, but if you're selling a product and, and brand matters and that product, like that's the differentiator, like, look, yeah. there's a million t-shirts out there. And, and the reality is most of them are pretty much all the same. Okay. Yep. 
don't get me wrong, there's some differentiation, and then I, I, that's a thing too. But for the most part, they're all the same. So why would you buy one over the other? And you've got two things: it's either price or what's on it. What are you? You're trying to express something on that, right? And so the authenticity of the message and what you're trying to say needs to resonate with people, and you need to be a storyteller. And so we just told a really authentic and good story all the time. Everything we did was about telling a baseball story. And in the, from the lens of like a pure um, long-term way it was. So and I, what I mean by that is, you know, in baseball and you could see it now, like there's, you know, uh, what's popular now in terms of like bat flips and how people react and, you know, maybe how they celebrate um, I black like the, you know, there's all sorts of things yeah. about baseball that maybe come and go. And it's like, a, like, it's like the things, the fringes of baseball. We've, we've kind of like never touched that. And we always talk about the really like the, roots, like the foundation. Yeah. Right. That, that, and, and I credit Travis with this, but he, when he was creating a lot of this content and trying to build a brand around baseball, he was like, I want this brand to live on when we're mm. 60 years old yeah. and that, that actually really resonated with me because uh, you, and you see this happening with uh, other smaller companies trying to like come up and create content in this space is that, you know, they're, they're latching on to very topical information, like very topical events, like, Oh, you know, Tatis junior did this, let's create a shirt around that. Right. right. Okay. That the problem that's exciting at the moment and you might actually be able to capitalize on, on the very short window, but you cannot win long-term mm. doing that. And yeah. so we, sh- we completely shied away from that. Yeah. Even though you feel like you're losing opportunities, it actually is the best long-term play. So yeah. um, it's all about storytelling. Now to your initial question, I've, and I've deviated. I love it completely, but uh, major league baseball players, we just told this really authentic story that never touched on topical information. And we found that we started getting like a gravitational pull from people who felt the same way about the game. Um, and so, you know, we get, we have, you know, uh, Justin Turner, Jed Lowry, um, those uh, players like that have, have really uh, have been huge advocates of ours yeah. and um, they've kind of gravitated towards the brand because it told that, that authentic message. That's great. Um, and we've never paid an athlete. We've never paid anyone to represent the product or the, the marks or anything that we do. So it's all, it's all, it's, if you don't, they're doing it cause they love it. That's amazing. So let's, let's take a step back because um, we, we've, we've talked about, you know, where, where we're at today, right. Base Polism, but I would really want the listeners at home to know, cause this doesn't happen overnight, right? You guys, you, you know, you mentioned, you know, since 2012, you guys kind of been grinding or 2005, right. Kind of getting Base Polism going. What, what kind of advice would you give individuals that are trying to grow a business? What kind of takeaways do you have? Like kind of gems that say, you know, this is what we went through. Avoid this, do this. Yep. There's a lot there. And <clears throat> I, uh, again, I, I wouldn't be able to cover everything, right? Yeah, I can yeah. give you my lens of yep. like what we experienced, um, on a business level, it, people have been you know really adversely impacted by this, but from the, just the business perspective, uh, what that really drove home that we did right was we were very diversified in how we communicated with our audience and how we sold. Mm-hmm. Right. So, We had multiple platforms. We have a strong digital commerce platform. We had our own direct retail chains. And then we had some wholesale relationships. And we we really were pretty nicely spread across that. And we were spread geographically as well. So we're not just we're not just in California. We're not just in Oregon. We're actually everywhere. Yeah. Okay, that diversification at the end of the day saved us in this one particular example, but it I think it it it, it resonates on a lot uh, more than that. I think when you think about if you're if you're building a business, right? And not everyone can do this. So again, this is not a this is not a one size fits all, but um, really think about uh, your customer base and how you're getting your message and your product across 
and try to constantly diversify that. If, if 80% of your business comes from one percent or one biz, other business, if you're B2B or whatever it is you're doing, right. um, that should be considered a threat all the time you should, oh, or a okay. risk uh, to you all the time constantly be be trying to diversify um and 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 gosh you know like if you would have asked me this question two years ago i would have i would have maybe given you a different answer about like here's things to think about i may not have gone to the diversification things Mm -hmm. quickly but going through it over the last months i could tell you that um uh i don't think enough people thought about this there's a lot of really really famous brands and famous like businesses that are did not survive yeah. last year because they they relied on one show. They had one kind of thing they did, and and, and they you know they relied on the big box in the mall or whatever it was. Um, and they found that that you know you kick out one leg of the stool, is the stool going to still stand? And, mm. and they found that they, a lot of businesses can do that. So I think about diversification. I think that's important. But gosh, there are so many things, right? I mean, yeah. Okay, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? Um, we always went for the low hanging fruit. Like think about that. Like go, don't, um, I get And as someone who's into the numbers too, I could tell you like, think about, um, think about scaling your business, um, in a way where it's always self funding itself. So in the way you do that is you go for the low hanging fruit first and then you, okay, once the, all the low hanging fruits done, you say, okay, where did I get with this? Because your commitments and your costs and your overhead are, are low at that point. And you're just, you're constantly moving up the ladder. Yeah. I think people get in trouble when they try to go from A to Z. Like they, they literally try to go from A to Z right. itself right. And, they're, and they're investing a tremendous amount of money or, or time or effort into something that they don't, they think that's where they need to be. And so they're just trying to shoot for that right away. Don't do that chip away and start at the, the very bottom and, and don't be afraid to be, you know, you're the one who started your company, but go to that fair or go yeah. and set up the tent and talk to the customer and sell them the product directly. And just every single sale, every transaction is a win. And I, so we've been doing this for eight years. I remember like it was yesterday I was, we were with the moment we launched our website and the first sale came in from someone we didn't know. Oh, nice. And, and then it, it was like, but I never, I was like, okay, this is incredible. And that, that rush when you actually are able to do a transaction. Yeah. And, but we were, we never felt disconnected from that. So every, we felt like we needed to drive every single one of those and we wouldn't be intimately involved with all of our customers and intimately involved as to the extent we could with everybody. Um, don't try to go too quickly, right? Mm-hmm. And and really and and get feedback early on. Try to really fine tune before you're too far down one road. Really fine tune based on feedback what your product needs to look like. Yeah. So this whole time while you were creating baseballism, you were still working in healthcare, right? Yeah. Or, or as as it, as it began. At what was what was like the pivotal moment for you? that you were kind of felt, okay, I can leave this career in, in healthcare behind and now continue to move forward with uh, baseballism. Yeah. That, that concept of like moonlighting is, is huge and important. I think uh, most people face this right. Very rarely actually do you get to just say, I'm going to jump in to my venture and that's right. all I'm going to do. Right. Most people have that side job. So what I, here's what I, well, here's what I did and here's what I would recommend. I had this established career and I had been working at OHSU. I had worked there for 12 years and, and, and gotten to like a director level by the time I left. Um, and I had a very stable career and I was very happy there. Um, but I moonlighted. Right. And so I, I moonlighted until for, until the two things intersected. One, the business actually needed me full time. Mm. Right. Gotcha. So I'm in a unique position. I had partners who, I was the last to go on full time. Gotcha. And so we phased people in when two things intersected, the business could afford it and the, at the business actually needed them full time. Interesting. And we didn't, and we didn't do any moves until those two things happened. Right. So I, I bur- literally burned the midnight oil for yeah. years, years. I would go to work, you know, Monday through Friday in a pretty demanding environment. Yeah, very and, demanding. Yeah. And, and demanding environment, demanding job. And I was, I was present all the time at work, but what I did from six o'clock to 
10 o'clock was the side hustle. Wow. And I did that for years until it was, it got to the point where it was very taxing. Yeah. The business needed me more than just six to 10. And then, you know, uh, it could, it got to a point where it was, it can economically afford it. And yeah. It wouldn't, it wouldn't burden the business, you know, by me going on. So those two things have to intersect. That was my personal experience. Now everyone right. has a different kind of right. exp- um, um, circumstance, but that's, that's how we, that's how we did it. Was there ever a moment during that, that transition of, of self doubt or even self doubt and the, the company was going to be successful? <clears throat> um, yeah. From, uh, cause I, I drank the Kool-Aid, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I saw it and I was like, man, I could see where, where this is, where this could be viable yeah. as long as we keep doing it. Right. I think where the self, the self doubts, when you make, when you do something that's not, doesn't come off really well perceived. So like maybe you have some, you know, you might have some early on positive feedback or you have, might have some early on like financial wins during your adventure. Um, and then you try, you, you keep moving. You're like, Oh great. This is positive right now. I, I'm, I gotta keep moving up, up the chain here or down this road. And you're going to find that not everything you do is going to be positively received. Or maybe you might have, you might make a, a financial mistake or whatever it is. Right. Um, and so those tend to be the self doubters when you realize like success is not linear. It, it, it goes up and down and it's, and so like if you were to graph your starting point and to your ending point, right. Um, and successless up and to the right, you're, you're not, it's not a linear experience. You're not constantly seeing growth. You're not constantly being positively and reinforced. You're going to find pitfalls. It's a, it's the spectrum of, of, uh, ups and downs, but you, and I think people fall into that. We're like, Oh my gosh, this didn't go well. So I don't know if I'm going to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. I can I give some good examples of that, but, um, you do kind of have to like, look, this is a weird moment. You kind of have to put the blinders on a little bit to that and be like, we're, and, and be realistic. Like not everything you do is going to be successful. So that self doubt's going to creep in. Yeah. And if you believe in like that underlining, whatever it is you're doing. And for us, it was, I believed in the underlining kind of like, I thought, I believe that baseball is going to be around forever. I believe I loved the concept that we were tapping into the right person. Uh, we weren't being topical. We weren't just trying to live in the moment where, you know, we were actually like, we're tapping into this like, huge history and I think it, had, it could live forever type of thing. And so I kind of bought into that and, and I wanted to uh, just focus on that. So self that came up all the time and we, and look like there's other things too. I mean, I've been through lawsuits. I've been through theft on many levels, like people breaking into the store, the mm. warehouse, employee yeah. theft, um, in things that you don't, that maybe you don't experience in the nine to five job. Like, like, you know, look, if you're, you're punching the clock or you're going to work, whatever it is, your thing is, um, and you're a W2 employee and you're, and you're grinding for someone else. Like you don't realize that maybe behind the curtain, um, there's a whole new list of, of things that come up that may be shocking to you when you tried your own venture and, you know, lawsuits and legal, you know, getting a lawyer, for, getting a letter and, you know, from someone saying like, you know, I'm going to sue you because you did, you stole my idea or something. And even though it's totally frivolous, you're going to experience that if you seek success. So mm-hmm. that self, it, there's moments of self doubt through those things simply because you're not aware that that's actually coming. And that's just a part of the process. Right. Um, so look, it's, prepare yourself 100% if you are going like you are you're going to have moments where not everything is all roses. Yeah. Right. And that's okay. Just keep pushing through. It's like, it's, you know, in sports, I mean, you have, when you, you're going to, you're going to have days where you, you know, you're going to have weeks where you go, you know, Oh, for 10. Right. And yeah. you're, you're going to feel like you're the worst hitter in the world. But you know, during the season or your career, you're actually an all-star and you, yeah. you got to push through the, the, the downs, the down moments. And just remember, you only have to be three of 10 to make to a be, couple you know, million, baby. You, yeah, make, you make that 300, you're making some money. Now, what would you say was, you know, now that, you know, your, your business has been growing, what would you say was probably the, one of the things that you wish you probably knew, you know, when you started it? That's a great question. Um, Yeah, I think, 
a uh, heads up about the pandemic of 2020 would have been. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. That I'm sure. <laughs> the, uh, how was that for, for baseball? I'm sure that was pretty rocky. Oh, it was really bad. Ugh. So let me, I'll tell you that's, I'll tell you the story. Yes. So, you know, this is, this is our, again, put, put yourself in a position where uh, you own a, you own a retail brand. Mm-hmm. You've got 11, brick and mortar stores across the country. Like these are your own stores. You're only selling your stuff at the store. This is not like a wholesale relationship. This is like you pay a lease on a space. You have employees and you sell your product. Right. So I've got 11 of those I've got, and then I've got this e-commerce platform. All right. So the pandemic comes now the pandemic hit and basically in in the United States, everything shut down mid March. Right. Yep. um, Of last year. Now our business on the retail side really relies on spring training, the regular season and then travel baseball in the summer. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're in the middle of spring training uh, last year. Things are going great. Right. And there's this kind of like bit of a buzz about, you know, the virus and um, how it's impacting, you know, Southeast Asia. Right. Um, and then, you know, mid March comes and it was like major league baseball says they're shutting it down. Right. So we had to, here I am and here you, I, I have not just one store in, in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is one of the two big spring training baseball locations. I have like four locations. Oh, wow. I have a year round store and then I have th- like two, two or three pop-ups mm-hmm. and, and they're really big economic lifts for us and they're important. It's an important part of our like selling season. And they went to zero. They, everything went to zero. Oh, right. So uh, like we should, we do like a million dollars in sales on the retail side in the month of March. And it went to zero. We got, wow. to, we got to March like third, 12th and it went to zero. Right. So, and then we rely on the next kicker is major league baseball. So we have stores around stadiums that rely on the flow of, of right. attendance and they come in to these baseball games and they leave and they buy some stuff from us and they go home. Um, and then we're getting word that like, okay, the major league baseball season is being delayed all unknown. And then here's the one thing that happened early too, that, that not a lot of people talk about or, or, you know, most people don't realize, but um, college sports called it early. So in, right, yeah. in like early April or even late March, NCA said, we're not playing. And we are, we have a really big um, presence for the college world series. Mm. The baseball college world. Series. Gotcha. So like here I am in March or like early April saying, okay, I just lost spring training. I don't know when major league baseball is going to play. I just lost college world series and I'm doing the math. Like I'm just like yeah. adding it up on my calculator. Right. Like, okay, I lost this, 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 and this. Um, and I'm like, well, we're not going to make it. And what we had just done prior to this leading up to 2020, we had just built a store in the, in, on the field of dreams movie site, yeah. in Ayersville, Iowa. And we just built a store in St. Louis right by Bush stadium where the Cardinals play. And that's a, one of the high attended franchises. Right. So I had just put in like over a million dollars in, in new store expansion. And, and, you know, we're in this growth path. We're trying to grow and build our footprint and brick and mortar was being really successful for us. So like we kept going all in and we just, we continue to go all in and we just built this, we just took all of our, you know, a lot of our residual cash and we put it into these new expansions. And, and I think, you know, rightfully so like knowing, not knowing there was a pandemic coming, it was the right move. And then we're sitting here in April and, you know, we're just doing the math. Like, okay, we owe these leases, leases. We have this kind of staff structure. We have this type of inventory that we just purchased, like yeah. to sell during these times. And um, we weren't gonna, like, uh, like we were just like, we're not going to make it we're going to have to, we're going to, we're going to lose everything. Right. And so we're, it's me and my team and you're in a war room saying, how, what is everything we can do? Right. So you're calling landlords saying, Hey, I can't pay you. we got to defer this rents. We have to, until we can get back open. Unfortunately, a lot of employees are furloughed during this time. So you're like, look, we can't pay you guys. Yeah. Don't work anymore. We'll bring you back when we can. You're having all these conversations with, you know, we have, I've got 140, 160 employees. Wow up and down depending on what time of the year it is. And so you're having conversations with everybody and it's just, it was overwhelming. Um, and then you have your own personal stuff going on. You're like, yeah. Oh, like your kids yeah. are out of school and you know, whatever it is, it was just absolutely devastating. And, um, 
it was a function of like getting out of it. Right. Was, I mean, a lot of sleepless nights, incredible, incredibly just difficult conversations. And, um, what ultimately ended up being the savior were two things. One is everybody went to go online to shop. Mm, and, yeah. and, and if you had a really strong, and this goes back to my diversification point that I made earlier, it's like, we were diversified. So like all these, you know, everyone's bored at home and they go on their phones and they're just surfing the internet and they're getting our ads and they're buying stuff and they're missing baseball and they're buying our t-shirts and our hats. And, and, and we, although it's not a one for one trade off, like we certainly, you know, I saw some, some dip in 2020. It was a tremendous lift online and to the point where it saved us. And then governments, you know, uh, subsidies came in with the paycheck protection program mm-hmm. and all these other disaster loans. And like we were able to tap into some federal, federal money and the combination between that and, uh, and a strong e-commerce performance during that time saved us. And, but if you would have put a gun to my head in April and be like, you know, is online going to, going to double over the next four months? I would have said no way. Like people are going to be scared at home. No one wants to spend money when they don't know if they're going to have a job. And like that just didn't, that wasn't the case. It was like, it was gangbusters online for us. Yeah. Yeah. I remember actually, you know, when I was in Syracuse for my um, capstone, I did an interview uh, for, we interviewed you and we had that discussion. I think it was right and during that time, which was, which was quite, quite an interesting time. So looking back on everything, what advice would you give yourself? What advice would you give a younger John? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So without getting nets and bolts ish yeah. on it, I, you know, like there's always little things that you say, Oh, well, you know, don't invest in that. And you should, you should have maybe put the store, you know, here or there, but like, look at the end of the day, um, the advice I would give myself is keep going. Mm-hmm. Don't stop. There were so many times where I, felt really like, man, I don't know if I want to do this or anymore. Like this seems really hard or like, I don't know what to do. Just keep going. Right. Right. And that was, that was, that would have saved me some grief if I, if I would have just kept telling myself that because the success, which, which we've gotten to now was over, was an accumulation of a lot of like, um, a lot of hard work. Right. Um, and, and I think entrepreneurs sometimes or people who want to start their own business think, oh man, it's, you know, I'm going to start this own business. I don't have to work for the man anymore. I got to like create my own hours. And there's some truth to that, but I tell you it, what you gain and maybe being able to like have a little bit of flexibility in your schedule, you lose in the unknown and the risk that you're taking, um, uh, and, and just the overall just heartache of just con- being, th- when you have a bunch of employees that maybe be working for you or whatever it is, you're the one that cares the most about it. Right. So you kind of feel a little low. Like, here's the other thing people don't talk about. It's very lonely. Yeah. It's really weird because when you're working for a business and you're working in a normal job, you're kind of, you're around a lot of people and you're kind of in the same boat. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, yeah. Hey, we're all working for so-and-so. It's and our disaster, but it's yeah, collectively our disaster. Collectively here. <laughs> and, yeah. And you build camaraderie with people around that. Now, when you're a business owner and you're kind of, you're the boss and you're, it's like, it all comes down to you. Right. What happens is it kind of separates you a little bit and you find that like, you, what you have to do in your experiences are don't map on well with other people that might be your friends or might be people around you. And so you find yourself alone and oftentimes don't know what, who to ask or talk to about yeah. things because they are not experiencing the same thing that you're experiencing. It's a very weird feeling actually. So even though like, and I, I have good friends who are entrepreneurs and started their own brands and businesses and they're surrounded by people all the time and they have a celebrity like, you know, this micro celebrity kind of status or whatever it is, but they just had mental breakdowns because they realized that they felt so in their own head and they couldn't talk to anybody. I would, that would probably be the next thing I would, a young John would say is like, Hey, be prepared for this. And there's some ways you can navigate that. Now, last question. Would you do it all again? Oh, and twice on Sunday. That's what I'm talking about. John Lomas, thank you again. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.